another one of our videos here on YouTube. We've got, as of 2024, we've got 900 plus videos on YouTube. I haven't looked at the exact number, but I know sometime last year we, we creeped over 900 videos at some point in time. So we've got a lot of videos on there, YouTube, about fixing things, how things work, and these electric fence boxes, old stuff, new stuff, about every brand and model you can think of. But anyways, um, a little story, if you don't already know, uh, the company that owns Zariba, uh, and they also own Red Snapper, Five Shock, Blitzer, American Farm Works, um, the old international brand, um, hold them they also own those brand names as well which aren't even around anymore anyways but anyways it's called woodstream they are they're the company that also owns those um you go to the farm store or walmart or whatever and you buy the uh or amazon even uh those little the wooden mousetraps i forget the company's name so i think it starts with a t but anyways they all they own the wooden mousetrap stuff too well, anyways, back in August of 2023, that company decided um, sent out a bunch of letters to all the repair places and distributors that, uh, as of November 1st of 2023, they were no longer going to be offering parts for any of their stuff. So they've had trouble off and on for a handful of years now, five years or whatever it's been, uh, off and on of having parts in stock. Anyways, they were kind of like hoarding them for themselves and not offering them, or they just didn't have them in general, and. Um, so they've had issues for a while, even before COVID was an issue um, with supply chain um, problems. So um, now you can't get anything new from them. So whatever parts are floating around out there, that's all I've, that's all that's available. So we've done a lot of retrofitting and rebuild on their stuff even before this issues come up. So, yep, the company's going to a throwaway mentality now. So if you value your hard and earned money. And yeah, they're cheaper up front, but it costs you more in the long run because you can't get them fixed or they're not worth fixing or whatever. Then all the money you forked over for to buy one is basically wasted. So, um, uh, it's just a shame. So anything made by Woodstream that's electric fence related, like Zariba, Blitzer, Five Shock, Red Snapper, American Farmworks. Me personally, I wouldn't buy any of them. Um, at all, uh, just because why put the money in buying the thing? They're plentiful. You can buy them all over the place. You know, tractor supply sells American Farm Works. I mean, buy Zariba about any big chain farm store, small feed store. Sometimes sell a variation of the things, but you can't get the dumb parts for them. Um, and there's some parts floating around out there, of course, but you can't get new parts from the manufacturer anymore. They don't even want you to send them to them. They're just going to tell you throw it away, buy another one. So, not us. We're going to try to fix things. We're going to retrofit. We're going to rebuild as much as we can. Because I don't, I'm not into throwing, throwing, throwing away stuff. I want to fix stuff. Old stuff, new, newer stuff. So, that's that's what we're going to try to do here. I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to plug this thing in. I'm going to take the bolts out, the screws out. And we're going to see. We're going to see what's going on. See if we can. Do some testing on the inside and come on, screw, get out of there. That's one thing I don't like about these case, uh, well, any case of the fence charger, charger that's got stupid deep recessed holes like this one's got down here. It makes a perfect hiding hole for spiders, bugs, wasps, mud dubbers, whatever. I like to make a little home inside of um dark places and it becomes a real pain in the neck to get the screws out sometimes because it'll clog it up get that the head of the screws all covered up in dirt and grime and it's a pain in the neck okay so what i'm gonna do with this one um testing wise i'm gonna do three tests one test is gonna be multiple things but uh, the other two tests are the transformer and the capacitor, but we're going to test the board. So I'm going to put my meter on ohms first. That's what I'm going to do, which is a horseshoe symbol. And I'm going to get um, a pair of pl needing those pliers out. And I'm going to unplug this red wire here from the board. That's the, this black, red wire and black wire over here are the primary or input side of the transformer in all electric fence boxes, at least solid state and low impedance. The primaries are basically all the same uh, for the most part in theory. 
they're very they're just a closed loop to allow the board and the capacitor to dump its power and discharge into the thing into the transformer so you want um it's closed loop so it should be very 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 low ohms like 0 0.1 to 1 ohms so you want to put on ohms there's no polarity to continuity or to ohm, to resistance readings so it doesn't matter where red and black leads go uh, I'm just trying to find the black wire down here. The only reason I unplugged the red wire, I couldn't have unplugged the black one. I want to take it out of circuit of the board. That way there's no interference of anything on the board. So it's going to go across it. Or meters to zero point, you know, bad glare. This is 0 0.4 ohms, which is fine. It should be between 0 0.1 and 1 on average. Now I'll test the output ohms. This varies from model to model, brand to brand. And it's just 13 and a half ohms. That's probably okay. I don't know what it's supposed to read exactly. So, um, all transformer low piece models, you know, they, they, the output ohms will vary across the board. You, you get anywhere from 4 ohms to 35 ohms. And it's not like it's a one size fits all brand and model because every, the internal windings are all different. <clears throat> so, in theory, this transformer should, I don't know what the output's going to be, but the, but the, um, uh, discharging uh, that this should be able to allow the board and capacitor to discharge into it so that part of it at least is fine so we're going to unplug this other wire here I'm just going to lift it up and just kind of slide it out of the way here for a minute so I can get this board out of the way so this capacitor is a separate component um, to the on the board it's actually bolted on there with a nut a little stud mount capacitor that comes through and it has a little hole there and a nut goes on it. So this uh, capacitor is a seven and a half microfarad capacitor. So we'll unplug one wire from the board. Let's pick the right one because it's right on top. Come on. Just that way because these capacitors, these yellow ones are built into the system as well. And I don't want um, these possibly or anything else to possibly interfere with the reading of the capacitor. So we have to put a meter on capacitance, which if you don't have a if you're not sure what you, if you got that meet setting or not, you know my tape on there because I'm missing the screw that holds the battery thing on there. Uh, it's this little yellow symbol there. It's a symbol for a capacitor. So if your meter doesn't have that, you can't test capacitors correctly. Not this type, anyways. So we're going to go across here. There's no polarity to it. It's seven and a half microfarads is what it's supposed to be. We're reading about four. So this unit is uh, this model that I've got. The serial number starts with the fourteen. So it's the twenty fourteen model when it was built. So we're going on ten years old almost from when it was built. I don't know when it was sold, but that's when it was built. So perhaps is going to probably need to be replaced um, once we get the thing figured out. Um, the other things that can sometimes go bad. I don't see any. You know, some cobwebs on the back of the board, but I don't see really anything else visibly wrong with the board. But the other two things that will keep the unit from working right is these two big black diodes here will sometimes go bad. They look good physically, but you got to actually test them 100% to know that they're good or not. And we'll check out these other little three little four little small diodes there. We'll also check out this SCR on there as well. Um, see if I get a number on there. I can't read it, so it's darn small. So now what we're going to do is we're going to put our meter on diode setting, which, if you're not sure what that is, it's a little white symbol above my thumb, and it's a symbol for a diode. And you're going to put your black lead on the stripe. Some diodes are, are big like this. Some are small like this. Um, some are white. Some are black. Most times they're black, but sometimes they'll be white with a black stripe. Either way, they all test the same way, big or small. So you put your meter, uh, they do have a kind of polarity in theory to them, which not really polarity, but it's a forward or reverse bias. So they're, only, they're like a, a one-way check valve. They allow power to go in one way, but not the other, kind of a one-way street sort of thing. So you have to put the lead on the right way to make, see if it's actually testing right or not. So put your red lead on the non-stripe side and the black lead on the stripe. And you should get a reading. Sometimes there'll be a solid beep, but it shouldn't be most times. It should be a beep, possibly, or no beep, but should give you a number of some sort like that. That They kind of vary 
you know, it depends on your meter. Sometimes the quality of your meter is not the greatest. But she'll give you a number of some sort, 0. 0.5, whatever it says, 0. 0.7, whatever it is. That doesn't really matter, honestly, to me, as long as it doesn't read, as long as it doesn't say OL or a 1 with nothing touching, that means it's, and you test it the way that we did, that means if it stays like this or has a solid 1 on there, doesn't change, that dial is bad. Uh, that means it's, it's, it's um, open on the inside. If it, if it beeped at me solid and read zeros or whatever, very, very low, then that means it's uh, shorted out or, uh, yeah, shorted out on the inside. It means it's, it's shorted together. So that would mean it's bad as well. So we'll go across here. So you get a different number, but it reads good. So if we reverse the leads, if you're just curious, but the red up here and black down here, it should not read anything. See? It's not reading anything that way. So we reverse the leads. It means it's reverse biased. It won't not read anything that way. So both these dials are are good at the moment. Uh, that means I mean they are good, not at the moment, but they are good. And we have to move on to something else. So we'll check these other little small ones here. They check the same way. Just a lot smaller voltage and amperage rating. So we just put a black lead on the stripes, and the red lead on the non-stripe side. Uh, see this one's even bad so maybe it's just a little bitty dial that's gone bad um, and I'm on the stripe side so maybe that's bad I mean I don't know what this dial exactly does in the circuit for everything else but it's it won't allow power to go that way uh, or whichever way it's going um, now we'll check this SCR on here um uh, Let's see. I always get confused. I always forget. Um, now this has three legs on it. It's hard to see, but it's got three little legs on it. Boom, boom, boom. That middle leg and this are electrically, physically tied together. So if you can't get your meter in there right, right, just right, put one lead up on the top there. And we're just going to choose a red one because they kind of vary from style to style. We'll put the red lead on the top there. We're just going to touch the outside leg. It should give us a reading of some sort, but we may have to reverse. We're still in a diode, diode setting, so this is not a diode, but you get to use the diode setting to test it. So right now it's not reading anything, so let's reverse the leads because I always forget sometimes which way to do it. Now, if it doesn't read a reading either way, whichever way we put these, then this is bad as well. Oh, there we go. So that reads there. That reads there. So... That is good. So what we need to do for now is just replace this diode. Uh, check this one down here. I don't know if I checked it or not. Yeah, that's good. Those resistors look okay. They don't look darkened, split open or nothing. Resistors don't go bad all that often unless they're burned up. And I don't see anything burnt. Sometimes this little MOSFET or whatever the heck it is that helps fire or trigger whatever this thing to fire um, uh, looks good. I mean, that was bad all that often, but it looks fine. Um, on this board, this re diode, I hate these boards, but the boards, on any board like this, they're double sided soldered. So it's, I mean, it's got solder on the top side, I believe. Maybe it does. Yeah, top side a little bit. As well, most of it's on the back side, but you have to basically. Get soldered off the top and the bottom. So we're going to try that. If not, we're just going to let's see how it fits in there real quick. Because we could always solder a dial on the. You know, if we have to, if we can't get the thing to pull off there because of solder on top, we'll snip it off. We'll solder a diode across the back side because there's there's a little space in there, I think, or we can put the diode up there and bend it over that way if we have to. As long as, as, long as it's physically. In the right spot, in the right polarity, whatever you're going to call it. <clears throat> so, what we need to do is my soldering iron powered up. We're going to um, use some uh, desoldering braid or solder wick, whatever you're going to call it. Ow. And we're going to pull the solder off the back. This is a brain that we use called Chemwix by Chemtronics. This is, I uh, got rosin flux type stuff built into the uh, braid here and it allows the heat transfer 
of your solder iron to the solder to be really good and it pulls the solder right off there absorbs it wicks it right up into the stuff and there's some cheaper stuff out there of course um this is a 50 foot roll and it lasts us uh anywhere from six months to a year depending on how much we're how much soldering and stuff that we're doing and desoldering we're doing but there's some cheap stuff out there it's like five foot long six foot long a little roll but it didn't have the the desoldering or the the rosin flux in it, and it takes forever to get anything to pull off there. It does not transfer the heat real well, and solder likes to flow towards the heat. That's why you put your iron against it and push on it, and the, the solder will flow into this trying to get to your iron because solder flows towards the heat. So, ow, a little hot. I can tell there's still some on that one. Just from, just from glancing. You can also get a little solder sucker, they call it. Those are, you can use those forever until they break. Um, those are pretty cheap. Sometimes they work real good in certain situations. Sometimes, sometimes I like to use this stuff. I personally use this 99% of the time just because uh, this technique I like using is not a right or wrong one one's better than the other certain situations you want to use probably this stuff certain other situation you want to use the solder suckers and you get those on amazon for anywhere from five bucks to 30 bucks depending on which one you want but i don't think this, this diode's going to pull out of here because still solder on top so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to snip this out of the circuit and get rid of it come on and I get uh, another diode. Um, I don't have a. Well, there's one small one here that, that'll work. I've got a next size bigger looking ones, and I got real big ones. But we'll just use another. This one's probably a little bit bigger than the one that was in there. You know, it's physically a little bit, bit bigger. So this is even probably better, better suited to handle the stress than than not than than the one that was in there. So we're gonna cut this lead back a little bit. I don't need all this extra on there. And then we've got to put it in the right way because there's a little nice thing is this board has a little stripe on it so you know which way the stripe goes for the diode. So it's going to go just like that. With the stripe matching up with the board. Some boards and some brands don't even, they have parts all over the board. And if they're old school type through hole parts like this one's got on there, um, it makes it easy to know which way the parts go in. Um, so let's, uh, I need to get a little solder on my, I'm going to tin the little tips here. Focus, tin the little tips of these wires here. Tinning, when it comes to soldering, just means you're putting solder on the lead, or like if you tin the end of your soldering iron, we call it, on the, in the industry, it means you're just you're tinning, you're adding solder to the, you know, the tip of your iron, so that lets it, that gets it ready to to solder. Um, it just allows a flow of the heat to whatever you're soldering on to be better. So now we're I'm just I can't zoom in at the moment. I should have zoomed in. I guess we're just going to heat that up, add a little solder to it, and now this this is going to allow us when we go to um, solder on the board flow a lot better so add a little solder to the top side here just get a little bit more surface area of, of um, solder on there and yeah, it looks pretty good now now this is pretty close quarters on working with this stuff so heat this uh, dial is going to get pretty hot pretty quick so i'm going to make sure i'm going to use a pair of pliers i got a smaller pair that'd be easier to, to use these larger ones i'm going to get it in the direction I need to be at, we're going to hold that right there, and we're going to this. I'll zoom in for this so you can see what I'm doing. Get the camera in my hand here, so, and then we'll position it like this. Perfect. All right, so we're going to take this diode, position it this way. And we'll hold it like oh shoot my fat hands in the way. Hold it side by side. So there's a solder on 
the lead as well as some extra solder on the board. The iron's got a little solder on it, so we should just be able to hold them side by side. Heat them both up together. Let them flow. You give it a moment to let the solder cool down and harden up. I'm going to bend that out just a little bit because it made it a little too too narrow, or not, not too close together. So we'll bend that down like that. Put a little, some extra solder on here. Just a tidbit. And then we'll, should spill to I'll look at a little closer. Oh, I don't like that. Okay, looks good. So let's um let's zoom out here in a second. Ooh, excuse me. All right, I'm, we will replace this capacitor, but just for now, we'll because it's good enough to the unit will run with it. Well, it's it's lost about half its joule output, so whatever or store joule, whatever it's got in this thing. Uh, let's see, I, I can remember now. I got, look at my, I got a cheat sheet with that uh, tells me what wire goes where. So the red wire for capacitor goes to J5, which is right there. So I figured it was, but just want to make sure. All right, we'll move, lift that up out of the way, the transformer. Put this board back in this little groove here like that. This sits in this little groove like this. And I believe the red wire, I think the black wire is down low and the red wire is up high. But let me look here. You see that, that one there is J3. Uh, J3 is yep, red wire for the transformer. So we'll put that right there. Black wire goes down below on the remaining tab. There's no fuses on this thing, so in theory, if everything is fine with this unit, my capacitor being a little weak, we should be able to plug this in and you should go to click and then we'll check the output and see what that reads. So let's plug this into the socket here. Hopefully no smoke. There it goes. Look at that. Camera's not picking it up very well because the bowl's burned out a little bit, but it is flashing down there. It picks it up every once in a while. It is flashing every single click, but the camera's not picking it up because of frame rate, whatever. So that's good. So we've got, got that part of it solved. Let's go ahead and get my fancy meter out. My, uh, come on. Oh. I've got this tester here. We're going to look at this number right there. We're on open circuit, no load. So we'll see what kind of voltage it's putting out. I think these yellow and black transformers like this one's got, it's usually right around like 8 kV plus or minus. So open circuit and low, make sure we're set where we want to be set at. Kilovolts, yep. We'll go across here to here. 8.2, 8.5, 8.4, 8, so right around 8,000 volts, so. There we go. Um, I'm going to unplug this for a second. Let's see what the um, uh, 10 mile, uh, this is half joule output. So this thing does check uh, output joules as well. Not stored, but output. So stored joules is probably close to 1.7 joule output. Let's put a 500 ohm load on. It's pretty standard load. Let's put it to, set this to 500. Got this on 500 setting. So see what kind of joule number it shows up on here which is on that on this screen right here this is our since we're on the set on the joules this is going to show us our output joules so we'll go across here to here actually reading higher than what the specs say it's reading 0.73 joules and so it's actually stronger than what it says it, it is let's put it to 200 ohms 
eventually we're going to come to a threshold of the ju of the resistance load, and it's going to drag it down too hard. Yeah, went down 0. 0.6 kV at two point. We'll check. We'll adjust this just to see if it makes a difference. No, put this in the middle so our voltage level. Ooh. No, not low enough. So it's like 200 ohms is threshold. We drop down to 3 kV roughly to 6.64 joules. So in theory, you know, this is it's a point. Five joule output, but we were getting uh, 0.7 whatever it was joule. So there is actually stronger than what the spec says on the front there. So that's always, I guess, nice to see. So we need to get another capacitor in there just to get it up the snuff to where it's because that's just eventually going to go bad. And it's a pretty cheap fix for this. So even putting another capacitor, they're not going to exceed the value of a new one. And plus, I wouldn't even buy another one of these new. I'd buy Power Wizard or a Gallagher or Parmac or something. I wouldn't buy another one of these junk, junk things. But we're able to fix the thing. Luckily, this go around. Um, let's. Uh, we got to be a little careful now because that stupid capacitor is charged up. Let me get my. Um, I've got a big, big resistor here. Because there's that white capacitor is all charged up now, as well as the little yellow ones. So I'm not going to, I can't really get to the yellow ones to discharge those, but we will discharge the big one at least. So we're going to go across the red wire from the capacitor, which I'm trying to figure out which one it is. This one here, as well as the black wire from the capacitor, which is hiding somewhere. Maybe I'll just get just this way here. Let's move the, move the transformer out of the way. And we'll just touch across here to here. This big resistor, I don't know what it's like, 500 ohm or I don't know what it is. It's a big, big high wattage one. And we're just going to go across here to here. Oh, yeah, a little spark come from it. So I'm going to leave on it for a few seconds. going to bleed it down. That's probably good enough. Now we can touch the capacitor. Without get hurt by the dumb thing, it won't really hurt hurt, but it it'll be unpleasant. Is it won't like kill you or nothing? At least this one won't. <laughs> this one won't. Um, but it hurt. It would hurt. It would be like a nine volt battery going up your arm when you put a nine volt battery across your tongue. It feel like that, but going all all the way up half your arm probably, at least in your hand or your finger, wherever you got bit by. So it would be more startle you than anything. Let's go ahead and pull the capacitor off, or the transformer wires off, just to just to get this thing out of the way, because we know the transformer's fine. Okay, we'll just remove it all together. All right, pull this board up. I'm using this now, my these pliers, as my as my finger. I don't want to. Um, hold on. Acting up there because I don't want to get bit by the board by accident. We'll move this out of the way because I, I just need to get this um, nut loose off of here. You know, dinky little thing, but. 10 years old has been still halfway good, so they probably could have got, if the board had to quit on them, the passion probably would have lasted, uh, I don't know, a handful more years, I guess. Um, eventually would have gone bad. Okay, now you find the, the capacitor is similar in size or a little larger. Now, I don't have very many of their capacitors to start with. I, I don't like them, so we don't, we never really stocked them, but we've got capacitors that will work. They're actually a uh, similar, um, Microfarads are higher, but larger voltage-wise that they'll handle. So it's a better quality one the last 20 years or longer. So let me do a little snooping around here real quick. Actually, I might have it right here. Uh, nope, that's a six. I don't want to. I, wanna, I don't want to go smaller. I want to go equal or larger, or not not too large, but larger, or large enough. Um, give me just a little bit of time here. I'll come back with you. 
All right, this is the eight microfarad capacitor. This is what we're going to stick in there. So now we might be able to um, solder this to the board because basically where it goes electrically is um, across this spot. This here, let's step a little closer. I'm trying to be careful. I don't touch the board on accident. Is this green area and this green area? That's where the capacitor needs to go. So if we could get this to solder in the board uh, that saves us from having to glue the thing in the place I mean we'll probably we'll put some uh, something on there uh, to help keep the board or capacitor secure minus soldering so we can probably solder it right there and then drill a small hole right there which is I think what we're gonna do and then what we can do is check We can check the uh, um, check the jewel output afterwards, you know, so you see um, how much it increased by. I'm trying to find my small, small drill bit. I want a small one. I don't want need a, uh, this one will work. I was going to have a real small one that would be perfect for drilling holes. This one is small enough that it would do the job. Now, there are no polarity to the capacitors either on this uh, type of type of situation, type of repair. Well, we're going to put it, put it over here. Come on. So we're going to put it there. And then I want to, um, right there. And I'm going to drill a hole here Oops. So kind of halfway test fit the hole okay pull close enough I think if we go right there I think that would be a better spot to put it because it's not for being more straight. Alright, so I'm going to do that desolder job again because this hole's all sealed up. So. Solder on turned off. It has an automatic shut off feature. So we'll. Uh, this one have to go to the back side or the front side. Both. It's got solder in the middle of it. So it'll matter if it goes top or bottom. Side iron is almost ready. Now it's ready. Should be, yep. Come on, get on there. Come on, a little bitty hole there. I really don't want to, uh, That's pretty straight. So now we'll flip it over. I feel the heat. All right, this capacitor wants to fall out of place. So what we have to use a trick that I do is I add some extra solder on my iron. I always put solder on there to start with uh, to tin the tip of the iron. And we'll add some six solder. We'll actually solder, use this, and we'll hold the capacitor to the board with our hand. Heat those two spots up. It kind of gets a crude, bad solder joint look to it. But 
it actually holds the capacitor in place for you. You can always then we'll do the other side, and then we'll come back and solder, thin, you know, clean that, fix that I want up a little bit, bit better. But so now the lead is coming through right there. We need to get over there, so we'll solder. Put some solder on it, get a piece of wire or something from there over to there, and it'll come back. When that's done, we'll come back and finish that one up again. So let's get a piece of wire. We don't need big heavy gauge wire. Just um, this gauge that we got is 20 gauge, so that's plenty. You don't need nothing great big, not a lot of not a high amperage situation. I think. That's exposed part of it is long enough to reach. Yep. So now what I'm gonna do get this cord keeps wanting to flip the board over. We're gonna add add some solder to this little lead poking through. Like that. Add a little extra solder there, that way there's a little more surface area. Then we're going to take that bit of wire that's stripped off. And we're going to tin the wire by adding some solder to it. Dang it. Need my third hand helper. I don't know what the hell I put it at. Help pull this stupid wire in place. Come on. Alright, there we go. Smooth that out a little bit. Now we're going to go from here. Let's hold the two together. Cool off a little bit, harden up, and then we'll hold those tight. Same thing over here, we'll hold those two together side by side where the solder's at, and then that lead should flow together like it did there. Cool off for a second. Basically, it looks like that. Then we'll come over here and we'll touch this one up now since that other side's holding it for us. Now, we'll, come on, flow for me, baby. There we go. So, in theory, we should be able to put this back in there. And when I get done, I'm a, I've got this, um... Oh, you see it on TV with that loudmouth guy, salesman guy, the flex glue, flex tape, flex whatever stuff. We got this stuff here. It's, I like this because it actually does a pretty good job for what we use it for. And I haven't had any problem with it hardening up on me where I can't get it out of there. So I'm just going to run a bead across like that and after it hardens up that will that will basically help support passer in place hold it there So it takes about 24 hours to actually fully cure, but it'll turn into hard as a rock, basically. And that'll help glue it, basically, in place. You can use hot glue, but hot glue can kind of peel off. And this stuff, once it hardens up, it's hard to peel off there. So that's why I like it better than hot glue. Plus, it's in a handy-dandy tube. 
So now that's what the board looks like, all fixed up and everything. So I would assume that our jewels will be a little bit higher now because it's both a bigger one than the by a little bit than what the factory one was originally at seven and a half. And this one reads eight, and this is reading like what, a little less than four. This is eight, so it's basically double. So in theory, will we get double the jewels? Will we go from point seven to one and a half? I don't know. We'll see. Uh, let's um, put. Well, actually, we don't need, <laughs> we don't need these wires on anymore. They're not being they're not being used. Come on. Don't need those anymore. Now we'll take this black wire. Remember it went down here. Red wire. Right there. Come on. Always plug it in, make sure it still works, hopefully it does. Let's plug these wires on next first before we do that. Well, that one's loose. That, that, that terminal's loose when you tighten that thing up. Alright, so see if we did our job right that it still clicks and functions. So clicks and functions. Let's take our Fancy tester here again. We're on joules. We're at open circuit, which we know is good. Let's put at 500 ohm lows. That's the biggest low that we went to that um, dragged us down to where it didn't uh, fall on its face. So it's what, 4, four point something kilovolts, like 0.7 joules. See what it reads now, just for curious. Almost doubled it, 1.2 joules, look at that. So we went from a 0.74 to a 1.2 joule, so it's actually stronger than what it was here a little bit ago, almost by double. Now let's see if it's any better here, because it was reading, what, 0.6? At like 2 point something, so actually, in theory it should be a little higher. Voltage might be a little higher, it's going to be lower here from what it is now, but it'll be hopefully higher than what it was before. Hopefully the the kilovolts won't drop as far, or the joules won't fall, fall as far. Voltage is a little higher, at 3.2 versus 2.9, but the, the joules is lower, which is fine. This is not a very hard-hitting, big, heavy-duty fence charger, but it is working like it should. Well, hold on, it would probably help. I had this set the right one. Let's try this again. There we go. Well, we're still at 1.2 joules at 3.2 kV. Let's go to 100 ohm. This will probably be really dragging on its nose. 2 kV. Let's adjust this at 0.9 joules. Below 2 kV, we're still holding almost a joule. So that putting that capacitor on there is really, really, really helping the, uh, the fence charger out, being able to tolerate loads and stuff on it. So um, it's that little unit now. I mean, it was probably doing okay before, but doing really good now. So, well, we'll write them up. Yeah, it took us a little longer to fix this one. If I hadn't explained everything that we did. I would be able to do this repair by half the amount of time or less, but you know, explaining things takes a little time to do. You know, there we go. We got a new capacitor and a new diode, and boom, good to go. This transformer probably is going to fail at some point in time. And this ten-year-old unit, you usually get about eight, twelve years out of one of these. It seems like seven to twelve years out of one of these, and we're right on the higher end of life expectancy of one of these things. So. We'll probably eventually have to replace this pass or transform at some point in time. But the money saved doing this will help offset the cost of this in the future and even worth buying a new one. Because we have a different transformer that we stick in these things that are a lot better quality than what 
uh, you can get these days. And since you can't get them anymore, definitely a lot better than what you can buy these days. But uh, anyways, thanks for watching this video. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you'd like. And until next time, see you guys later on. And have a good rest of your day.